once in a while, just do one of those. <laughs> It's a lot easier for him to do it than me. On the wall, last uh, talk, we had participation from Second Life, thanks to uh, some Gary's project, especially Larry Taylor in the back here. We're broadcasting live in Second Life. And just if you're watching the screen, saw Gary's avatar, his virtual self, dancing. Maybe you'll do that for us. <laughs> Um, so we are broadcasting live. This is kind of neat. And I hope you guys uh, take advantage of that and let Gary talk about that some more. Um, today's talk is about towards multimedia surrogates. Most of you, I'm sure, know Gary already. And probably what the video project is going on. It has been. And now Google, YouTube, many groups are getting in, putting video out there. And Steve Jobs has his way to get rid of digital rights management. It'll all be free and all the search it, how we index it, and hopefully we'll hear some answers to that or suggestions for things to think about today. So I'll turn it over to Gary. Thanks, Brad. Um, you, you should know that um, uh, if, if the microphone picks up uh, any of your questions, it'll also show up in Second Life, so try to keep the swearing down. Um, or not, or not, right. <laughs> So oh, um, this uh, this talk uh, is uh, based on um, uh, work that's been kind of percolating around uh, in my head for about the last five years, and um, uh, I hope it'll come to fruition and and um, a, a series of publications uh, in the um, months and uh, probably years ahead. Uh, there's about three parts to this uh, talk, and and so um, the first part is ostensibly about multimedia surrogation, and most of it will focus there. Uh, and that's um, related to some research we've been doing uh, on the Open Video Project uh, for the last several years. But the last part is actually a little bit more provocative and perhaps more interesting, and um, will um, uh, tell you a little bit about some of the things that uh, uh, I've been thinking about, and, and certainly others here at SILS uh, uh, have as well. So uh, the outline goes something like this. Uh, we'll, we'll sort of start with a uh, review of what surrogates are, uh, what they used to be, uh, look at representation as an issue, um, talk mo mainly about multimedia surrogates using the Open Video Project as a case study, uh, with uh, some emphasis on a, a question that actually hasn't been addressed uh, in either the uh, multimedia or the uh, indexing literature, and that's the question of synchronicity of surrogation. Uh, and then uh, uh, close with uh, some uh, of these uh, thoughts about surrogates for you. So what is or was a surrogate? Um, yeah, it's a condensed representation, and it's constructed to stand for some information object. If you go back to some of Borco or Lancaster's classic writings, um, uh, you'll find definitions like this of surrogates. And they've uh, always played a very important role in science. I was strongly influenced by Larry Heilprin, who was um, sort of one of the fathers of information uh, science. And uh, he used to say that, uh, uh, that information science was about compression. That's the fundamental problem of the field. And so, in a way, surrogates are compressions of, of information. Uh, I'm going to use the word representation um, to uh, talk more, more about this. What do they do for us? They, uh, they enable uh, decision making uh, by actually presenting structured um, um, uh, uh, summaries. They support sense making. And this is actually the, the stuff I'm, I guess, mostly uh, interested in, and perhaps incidental learning. Uh, they certainly say time, a human time. We call this compaction to sort of distinguish it from compression, which is more of the system um, information. And uh, they say network capacity and uh, system resources. And there are lots of examples, uh, abstracts, uh, uh, glosses or summaries, uh, bibliographic records, uh, sorts, uh, profiles, and so on. A logo for a company is, in many respects, a surrogate for the company. So the Nike Swish is a pretty important uh, logo for that company. And a lot of money and effort went into creating that. And, and uh, so there's, uh, there's, it, it, this goes beyond just um, uh, surrogates for documents. So there's a blur that's been going on for quite a while now. And uh, the, uh, the, I'll, I'll use a metaphor for uh, those of you who are old enough to remember the old 
artificial intelligence debates knew about the, the neats and the scruffies. So we sort of have the uh, relatively neat past uh, in which you know, we could actually create surrogates, and the surrogates were really clearly distinguished from the primary objects. And the sort of very scruffy present in which it's all blurring together because of digitization. Uh, and so this is um, uh, both an opportunity and a challenge uh, uh, for us as we uh, have trouble distinguishing the primary from the secondary and uh, tertiary and entry uh, uh, type um, uh, of representations. So I would, uh, this I'm, I'm hoping is going to get some attention from those of you who are uh, metadata mavens. Um, uh, I'd like to suggest as a continuum uh, for these kinds of surrogates, I'll uh, call it the metadata surrogate continuum, and it has, uh, it's related to issues of representation. And uh, it seems to me that metadata uh, are, are really mainly for retrieval purposes. And I know this is not what, the way everyone thinks of metadata, but to sort of uh, put a, sh a little sharper point on it, if we uh, try to distinguish uh, uh, different uses for, the, for these uh, representations, then metadata is for mainly retrieval, and I'd suggest it's mainly for machines. Uh, and in fact, um, the semantic web is very much about this. Uh, trying to uh, actually uh, uh, support rich metadata that allows machines to bring back the right things at the right time uh, for the given uh, um, uh, human setting. Uh, and so this uh, uh, relates to research on automatic metadata generation, uh, implicit links, and data mining techniques that uh, are not just looking at the actual objects in uh, cyberspace, but also the, um, in the, uh, the links and, uh, and uh, events that take place. I would like to suggest that surrogates, on the other hand, are mainly for sense making and they're mainly for people. So surrogates are things that we actually look at, we understand, we, uh, we, we um, uh, make sense of from humans. Uh, the, the, the dozen or so, or actually two dozen or so, very specific technical settings in your Dolby um, 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 uh, system for playing music are technical. No human ever wants to know what those are. Right? Those are metadata that are for machines to actually represent the music. Um, surrogates, on the other hand, are things like, oh, the name of the song, or, you know, that's the Beatles, or whomever, are things that are of interest to us. And so that's per perhaps one way to sort of stretch out this continuum is sort of human-machine uh, uh, kinds of uh, applications. Um, there are lots of examples here, and professional abstracting is the classical way to think about, um, yep, uh, the classical way to think about uh, uh, creating uh, um, uh, surrogates and uh, it, it um, uh, is, is very much uh, uh, happening by, through social tagging on the human side today, but also um, uh, machine-aided uh, 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 kinds of, of surrogate creation in which people are still doing the creation, but they're being aided by machines. Yeah, Cal? So it seems like um, one of the conflicts with those two conceptions is that retrieval is something that people do and you're putting that in the metadata category. No, machines do that. People do information seeking. Okay, people see what they're <laughs> right. Okay. Because yeah. it seems like if you follow the sort of life cycle of a digital object, a whole lot of the metadata that's developed along the way isn't necessarily for retrieval, it's for management of all these different kinds of things. It looks like yeah. retrieval is actually one of the main points at which we know humans in some way come into contact with the digital object. Well, that's sort of the, the purpose for, of doing the management. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so the management par uh, portions are um, are ultimately for the purposes of retrieval. So yeah. So um, here's kind of a graphical representation, I think, of what I've just said. Um, that you know, the classic uh, knowledge representation um, uh, sort of literature talks about uh, the kind of primary object, the world, the real, the reality, and it could be physical or mental, in the way I think of it. When you create an information object. You write a sentence, you write a book, you, uh, you know, paint a painting. Uh, you've now actually created a representation for the real world. Okay, so that's a, that's a new level. And um, that's what I might call le a representation level one. When we create abbreviations or summaries uh, for those information objects, we're now at a second level of representation. This is a gross oversimplification, of course. There are lots and lots of levels in, in, in actuality. But to simplify things, we have at least these three levels. And I hope everyone sort of can say, yeah, sort of, I get that. 
Here's, I think, what's happening in the um, digital realm is that the information objects themselves are blending into the physical world. We have the example of Second Life here, and what's real? Uh, that's not really me there on the wall standing there, um, you know, uh, but it has some actual um, uh, implica implications, and it actually can have some real meaning in my life. It's my money. Right. Um, the metadata, the surrogates, the annotations are themselves also digital. The information objects are digital, and increasingly, the real world things we deal with are digital, and so there's this blur. And, and this, this makes things um, uh, somewhat complicated for us and, can, and sometimes confusing. So, multimedia surrogates, that, that's the background on surrogates. The multimedia surrogation goes something like this. Uh, we can think of this two ways. We can think of it as surrogates for multimedia. We're trying to find representations for objects that are themselves uh, media. Or we can say the surrogates themselves are multimedia. And we don't have very many of those. So right now we have a lot of this. You take a video, you take an image, and we <coughs> attach words to it. And, and the, the trend seems to me to be to actually not just attach words to things, but to attach media to things. Right? So um, album art or movie posters are sort of classical in, in uh, past times. We'll um, uh, try to imagine some uh, ways that we might be able to annotate, <coughs> let's say, video with video um, and uh, 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 other, uh, other kinds of media with, uh, with media itself. So our research here uh, at, at SILS is really focused on video, and, but I, I would like to broaden this to a more general, uh, or at least make it toward a theory of surrogation in the long run. Okay, so to uh, focus for uh, 15 or 20 minutes so on video surrogation. So this has basically been driven by the technical community, signal processing, video retrieval sort of applications. Um, the notion here is to identify some sort of features, uh, color, luminosity, uh, some, some, something that you can actually say, all right, we're going to index on this. Uh, it, you know, faces or shapes are, are um, uh, sort of the, the current uh, um, cutting edge kind of work. Can't we do a better job of actually identifying and labeling objects uh, in things rather than these uh, more abstract uh, uh, things like uh, the amount of motion or the amount uh, of color uh, or um, uh, um, brightness. So um, the, the classic example is uh, color histograms as a way to index video by uh, looking at how the changes in the color patterns across frames. Okay, so that's sort of classic. Uh, and there are lots of companies that have been formed to uh, work in this regard, Mirage and Sonic Foundry as being a couple of them, lots of projects, uh, a couple of IBM projects, Marvel Magic being uh, illustrations, and lots of university projects. Infomedia at Carnegie Mellon, uh, in my mind, was certainly the most innovative and uh, um, yeah, interesting of, of, of all these projects. Um, Fischler in, in Dublin, and uh, I'd like to think uh, that we're doing some nice stuff at, in open video. Track the text retrieval conference has a vi has had a video track for several years now, and this year they were all, they're adding a, um, a video summarization um, uh, task. So uh, we'll be participating in that. Now, uh, what are some examples of non-textual surrogates? Uh, poster frames. You see a lot of this now, uh, either for images or for videos. Uh, storyboards. Uh, we we've been using storyboards for quite a while, and, and it's, uh, so have other people. They're quite effective. People like them. Uh, slideshows, uh, they're actually faster for people to uh, process, uh, but they, uh, uh, people tend not to like them because they don't have control. Uh, there's all sorts of interesting collages uh, that, uh, that people create of, of images for videos. Uh, we've been uh, using fast forwards, uh, quite, and, and these actually are quite effective. People really like them. They, they tell us uh, something about the video that's not just the image qualities, but it tells us something about the temporal qualities as well as the length of the video and maybe something about motion and the uh, distribution of cuts and scenes across the entire video. Um, we do it in a really simple way. We take every nth frame. In the case of open video, it's every 64th frame. So it's quite a big compaction rate uh, to use a fast forward and still get some sense and be able to make sense out of this video in, in a, um, a much faster uh, way. Um, skims were Infomedia's attempt uh, to actually integrate the audio and the, the visual properties. They used se uh, seven different kinds of features and tried to integrate them. Expensive, uh, but uh, quite, quite interesting. 
Um, and um, uh, uh, Hollywood uses uh, trailers or rushes uh, that are custom made. Sometimes they're excerpted, but sometimes they're actually custom made to actually grab the high points or even, you know, sort of seduce you into thinking the video, the movie is about something that maybe it's not. Um, and our latest work is really on uh, uh, audio kinds of uh, surrogations and we've been working with uh, keyword uh, or uh, descriptions uh, spoken as um, um, surrogates. So here's uh, just an example from open video of uh, a hit list. And you might think that you know, here's a poster frame, and that's kind of a surrogate for this video. It tells you something about it. You know it's in color. You know that it's, uh, it's got uh, uh, some sort of a user interface uh, thing going on here. We've got the words. And in fact, we have lots of evidence that words are actually the most powerful and more useful carrier of information for documentary type uh, and educational type videos. That may not be the case for, say, drama where music and, uh, and uh, really is extremely powerful. Um, here's another view of uh, surrogates just uh, in a different sort of way, um, but uh, basically um, uh, a reorg of, of the uh, display. Uh, here's um, uh, the way we usually provide uh, an, an alternative for people for s uh, surrogates, uh, a short excerpt, a storyboard, or a fast forward, as well as the traditional bibliographic information. And between all these things, you're getting a lot of information about this video. You can make a decision about whether you want to take the time to actually grab this MPEG-1 and download it. Uh, here's an example of the storyboard, um, and so on. All right, so you, you've all sort of seen this sort of thing. The audio surrogation is um, really interesting to me. Uh, it's, um, it's another low-hanging fruit idea. Fast forwards were a low-hanging fruit idea five years ago that we took advantage of, and it was like, uh, duh. Why didn't people do this, uh, and why aren't more people doing it? Uh, it's, it's easy, it's, uh, it's simple to, uh, to automate, and it's really, really effective. And people like, not only is it effective, but people also like it. So you get the, the, the double bonus there. Audio surrogates, I think, are the same thing. And now that our, our tools are getting better, we can certainly uh, do more with audio. So spoken descriptions or summaries uh, are, are one approach to this. Uh, we might uh, imagine vi visual displays, and I'll give you some examples of that. Audio skims or some sort of excerpts we've been um, um, trying to play around with and imagine how that might work. We've looked at compressed speech, and you can do compressed speech at two to maybe four times spe uh, speed. But uh, it, it's really very hard uh, to do 4x, and uh, uh, that doesn't give you the compaction rate of something like the fast forwards that are 64x. Um, parallel streams uh, are actually playing multiple streams at the same time. We've also played around with that, and uh, it actually doesn't scale very well either. Well, certainly it doesn't scale very well, but it's also not very effective because we're pretty good at recognizing our name or something in a, a crowded room, but to actually try to make sense of several videos playing uh, through an uh, audio uh, stream is not uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, easy. So here's um, a couple of visual representations that you might imagine. Uh, some bu a bar graph or a pie chart that looks at distributions of kinds of audio signals. So in this case, you know, we've got um, uh, white noise and nature sounds and speech and music and uh, machine noises and so on. You can classify these things and you can lay out, you know, you can see that there's a lot of music and a lot of speech um, in this particular video. Or you could do it as a, as a pie chart. Here's another way to think about it, a little more um, uh, compressed, a uh, little more co it, uh, coded. <coughs> um, let's, uh, uh, Robert and Isha should recognize these. They did them. Um, the, uh, this, in this case, it's, it's kind of a stacked bar kind of idea in which we're, we're coding uh, uh, silence, music, speech, and music sound, sounds uh, in a, across the entire video. Now, the, the difficulty with this uh, is that it overloads the visual channel if you're also using this in conjunction with the visual surrogate, right? And so um, we're, you know, we're interested in, in this as a possibility for certain kinds of applications. We're not so convinced this is actually the scalable way to go. Um, a really simpler idea that uh, I think we have some pretty good evidence uh, uh, for is um, a recent study that uh, we conducted, uh, we had 36 participants within subjects who looked at a visual-only storyboard uh, representation for some videos, audio-only uh, that were um, uh, spoken uh, descriptions, these short, uh, manually created one or so sentence uh, uh, descriptions, 
and then a combined that had both of them. And uh, we looked at accuracy, time to view, time to complete tasks, and a, a, a whole suite of effective measures, uh, engagement, enjoyment, satisfaction, usability, uh, that sort of thing, uh, learnability. And um, what we found, uh, not too surprisingly, is, is that in most cases, the uh, combined were best and were preferred. However, the interesting thing was that the audio was almost as good. Just the audio alone. Now, we were using NASA video, um, educational videos. So the genre here makes a difference. And you know that's clearly a, a caveat. But in this case, the audio is really, really very close to the combined. And uh, it actually turns out that people can visually experience the surrogate much, much faster if they just look at the uh, storyboard and scan it. Uh, statistically significantly faster. But when they actually do the tasks, not much change. So the penalty for that extra time of consuming the surrogate doesn't carry over to a penalty when you're actually doing something with that, the information that, uh, that you inferred or, or gathered from that surrogate experience. So the implications here are, you know, we should add audio surrogates. I mean, it's, it seems like a reasonable thing to do. Uh, it, um, uh, and especially for small form factor sorts of devices. So as more and more people are doing video kinds of things on PDAs or cell phones, you've got to use uh, audio. Uh, audio and visual quality are important. We found that people had difficulty with um, the uh, vo uh, voice synthesis uh, uh, that we used, even though that was pretty good. And they, when, the st when the storyboard keyframes were, were small, they, uh, some people had trouble seeing them. Uh, and uh, the synchronization was the interesting kind of, uh, ah, ah, something really interesting that came out of the study. Um, it might not be necessary to synchronize these surrogates. And uh, we went into the literature, and we just couldn't find anything on this. So I went to the multimedia conference. I talked to you know, people who've been doing either compressed speech or speech uh, retrieval or video retrieval for 20 years. No one had sort of uh, uh, had any pointers for me or knew of anything about this. And um, this notion of synchronicity is, is really a, kind of a fascinating one because the assumption is that we should synchronize because we know from all of the evidence, the psychological and educational evidence of media, that coordinated media channels are, are a winner. They lead to better understanding, they lead to better retention, satisfaction, you know, it's, you know do that. You know, otherwise, you're just get, giving people chaos. Now, and so we've assumed, certainly for the last 10 years or so that I've been doing video kinds of stuff, that surrogates, if they were multimedia, should also be coordinated. What this study and, uh, and some of the reflections uh, that we, and, 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 and uh, sort of pilot stuff we've done since is suggesting is, well, let's rethink that. Maybe that's just an assumption. Because these are surrogates. These are a level of abstraction away from that level one representation. Um, and in fact, maybe it makes better sense to actually sample out of each of those two, two or more different channels and then present those to people and let them integrate them. Okay, so we've, uh, we've got a proposal pending. We've got a series of studies that we're about to uh, embark upon. And here's a sort of graphical representation of the trade-offs. You might think of it as, you know, here's one way to consider it. Let's pre-process everything, coordinate, carefully what comes out of the visual and the audio channels. And remember, there's more than two channels in, in each of these cases. So really, we're talking about probably a whole stack of, of channels. But to simplify, we'll think about just a, a couple here. Uh, this pre-processed integration uh, is done at, in advance. And it, um, it probably improves um, the um, uh, certainly the, the transmission and the um, original rec recognition, but I wonder about whether it leads to less sense making because there's less load on the person in terms of having to put these together. My suspicion and our hypotheses uh, uh, that we propose is that if it seems like the channel should be coordinated to people and they're not, they'll be confused, it won't be very effective, and they'll hate it. It's clear that these are not synchronized like it is when you're just speaking keywords and then you're seeing a fast forward or a storyboard. 
then it's actually not a problem. People know, oh, this, you know, trying to actually put these together. And in fact, they're able to integrate them pretty well. And this actually might be a better way to go, right? in which you systematically sample from the different channels. And you basically add some cognitive load effort on the part of the user at the time of interpretation. That cognitive load probably leads to better sense making. Now, how we're going to measure this and so on is, of course, a, a, a big methodological issue. Uh, but uh, that's our, our set of goal, and, and we'll be at this for the next um, uh, couple of years, probably. So um, let's, yeah, Laura. In, in what sort of context are you uh, having these people? Like, why are they looking for this information? Thank you. Thank you. Ah, okay, so the, the question was, uh, in what context do, uh, do we do these studies? Where, what's, what are peop why are people doing this, this searching? So the, the classical uh, um, uh, response to that is people are searching for, info, uh, for a video about some topic. So it could be a teacher who's saying, I got, I'm going to teach about um, um, geometric shapes uh, uh, to you know, uh, upper elementary school children, and I'd like to have some, some video that relates to that. They go in, they do a search, they get back like 50 videos, uh, and now they want to quickly try and decide which of the videos I should uh, actually uh, look at to see if I want to use them. So that, that's, that's sort of the, the canonical uh, example in, in our case. Uh, it could be something um, a more uh, a, in a quite different situation, a film editor who sort of is looking for lots of stuff that came off of the cutting room floor and it's been digitized. You know, they might have a different motivation for it, but some of, this, uh, some of the kinds of queries would be, um, uh, I'm looking for things with a lot of red or have a lot of action. So the, the feature sets might be different, but it's still the same sort of retrieval uh, uh, type task. But, Jerry, kind of a follow-on question. I think of these things in two categories. One is to decide what you want to retrieve the video. Perhaps videos are large object mm -hmm. like images, <clears throat> the interaction techniques are somewhat different to figure out what you want to retrieve compared to actually finding out maybe a piece of information that's in the full content item. You know, what, what was mm -hmm. the president wearing at this time? And do you guys differentiate between those kind of tasks as you do this and uh, you look at uh, maybe interactions that work well in both those cases? Yeah, well, absolutely, because we do segmentation. So, uh, the, so uh, the, the question had to do, do we distinguish between um, sort of uh, paragraph retrieval or, or document retrieval, if I can s sort of summarize it that way and relate it in text. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, because we, we do segmentation. And, and so uh, we'll take a, a NASA video, for example, that's uh, 30 minutes or 60 minutes, and we'll ch uh, break it into conceptual chunks. So you can act either retrieve the entire video, or you can retrieve uh, the five minute or eight minute segments. And um, to, to that extent, we've actually done different indexing, right? Because each, each of them have their own keywords, their own descriptions. Uh, now, we're not doing very sophisticated work on this because we basically say we're going to index the small chunks and then we'll aggregate all of the metadata together uh, to form the, uh, the, the longer piece. Uh, but I think, I, I, I think there's, there's a, a beginning sort of, of work there. The, the idea of actually reusing video, especially in a mobile uh, sense, is, 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 uh, is very much on, uh, on our minds. And um, I, I can't say we've actually had studies of that yet, because we don't have enough experience of people integrating video into their conversations. But I think that's going to happen. So, so uh, yeah, uh, there, there will be differences, clearly. Uh, I think the, the question Laura asked about the task is, is, is really uh, uh, spot on here, that, and, and I think likewise yours, that um, it, it really depends on what your goal is. The video editor who really just, who knows a sort of a scene uh, she saw like uh, two years ago that she wants to find, that's very different than the teacher who's actually looking for something interesting that might motivate this geometry concept. Yeah. So um, to try to sort of take this notion of media, multimedia circulation, <coughs> synchronicity, um, can we actually mark things up with media rather than just words, a little bit further, um, I'd like to sort of move it beyond just video and think about just non-textual tags. So do any of you on your cell phone have, instead of your phone numbers being documented by a name, by a photograph? 
Well, here's an example of an image that stands for someone, right? Um, these audio annotations you can do on most cameras, uh, uh, digital cameras nowadays, another kind of annotation that is a media annotation on another piece of media. Uh, geocodes on images. If you haven't played with zone tag, it's a, it's really interesting that you, know, you're, you take your phone, you do a snap of uh, a, a snapshot, you upload it to Flickr, and it gets geocoded. Right? So that now you have another way to not only retrieve that, but also to embed it in mashups that tell you about sort of your life or your friend's life, uh, and uh, it, it adds this new kind of value. And it's not exactly. Uh, in this case, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's more statistical information. Uh, a video upload of, of comments on YouTube would be another kind of example that instead of me just typing in, oh, cool video, man, or oh, you suck, or whatever, you know, that people tend to type in on those uh, um, uh, YouTube comments, you can actually upload video comments now. Right? And so you add a video, uh, and it might be, oh, I can do this better, <laughs> or, or it could be something uh, more interesting. Um, and avatar characters in Second Life. So um, uh, Larry's been after me to take my newbie Second Life avatar, which is basically your jeans and T-shirt that you get, no shoes, no anything, and you, you know, and and said, and he said, look, you're going to be giving this talk. Why don't you actually, you know, dress up? Uh, and um, so I, I, I grayed my hair and I got, I, I sort of put on some sort of shirt and, and, a, and a Carolina blue T-shirt. Um, and uh, that's about as far as I got. But I, as I was thinking about it, I was going, well, I have a mustache. Yeah, there's a mustache. It's, it's on the other side of my face. Um, the, the, the thing that this what it occurred to me is, well, how much do I really want to reveal about myself? So if I decided I want to put, like, you know, green spiky hair, which I might be inclined to do, but, you know, what does that say about me? And do I actually want to reveal that to people, right? Now, it's one thing in this room or in my real life in which I actually have a physical cues to help me get feedback on and sort of monitor my projections. But when you're doing this in cyberspace, you lose control. And I'm going to say a lot, I'm going to say a lot more about this um, shortly. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's something that I don't think we think enough about because we haven't had any experience with this in our real world past. So the question becomes, when do our surrogates, things that stand for us, actually become us? Right, so keep that question in mind uh, as we sort of move to this next um, phase of discussion. Um, So here's a couple of examples. So here's um, an example of, of a property of digital surrogates that we didn't have in the past. And that's that digital surrogates are malleable. We can change them and, and other people can change them. So you know, here's a nice little photograph of this pensive bride. And you know, you can somebody else can just change the size and look at it in a different sort of way. Now that's not much, but you know, this is like duh, of course. But you can't really do that with a physical surrogate that's static. Right? So here's um, a little more perhaps troubling or interesting example. So um, this is um, more Nainan's tag cloud. So this is him. And in fact, when I said, you know, I'm going to be giving this talk and I'm using your tag cloud, he said, he, he, he wanted to look at it. I said, oh, thank God there's nothing embarrassing there. Uh, <laughs> These are photographs, and if you go in and you look at his photographs, they're like from all over the world. He's been in all these great and interesting places, and da da da. But you know, you certainly wouldn't want to have one that was, you know, in the brothel or something. Uh, 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 not, no, no. Um, but this is something. It's on the web. It's there. It's public, and he was very conscious of this. Uh, wait. Sorry, I gotta keep moving. Um, Here's an example of him. What do I know about him as because of this? So here's a couple of um, examples from um, YouTube. So thanks to Paul Jones for pointing out uh, at least one of these. Um, the, your favorite? So there, yeah, you all know the YouTube song one. Well, apparently Bank of America 
America uh, in one of its many takeovers of some other company, um, uh, there was some meeting of um, probably mid-level executives, and one of those guys decided to do kind of a karaoke, um, you know, we're all one, using the, U the U2 song for Bank of America, you know, we're one, we're wonderful, we're all, you know, happy together, da da da, da and put it up, somebody put, did, just held up their cell phone, captured it as a video, and put it up on YouTube. Well, what happens? Somebody watches it and goes, what a dork, or that was pretty cool, or whatever, you know, and it's some, all the range of things in between, and starts to do responses. And one of the responses is a comedian sort of, um, takeoff on a takeoff. And of course then we have a, take, a comedian and a musician's takeoff on the takeoff on the takeoff. And this cascading set of uh, videos on videos on videos, you know, how would you understand this one? Well, you have to know something about YouTube, I guess. And maybe Bank of America, I guess. But how would you understand this one? <laughs> Not when you say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, but 50 years from now, if somebody pulls out this video and says, this video was played 300,000 times. I mean, that's, you know, that's a, that's a, a part of, of popular culture that somebody might want to study. How do, we, how do we help them understand what the heck was going on here? Somehow you have to have these traces of things. And that, that idea of how much context do you actually have to capture and add for the future from an archival point of view is a project that Helen and Cal and Paul and uh, I have been thinking about and uh, hopefully will continue to be working on. Um, second example is uh, this is a pretty cool um, ninja assessment uh, that, uh, uh, video that was done. And um, uh, this, this is actually about copyright, um, intellectual property. It's kind of funny. And there's a response, uh, and then there's a response to this response that I'm thinking is actually spam. And in this case, it really is exactly what Helen just said. Somebody just trying to get um, some um, um, sort of free advertising. How do you sort of say, well, we'd actually like to save these two, but not this one? We have no clue about how to do that at this point in time. So the, the notion is that you know, somehow, we need to be thinking about these cascading sets of pile of stacks of surrogates to surrogates to surrogates, and what are the ones that are worth paying attention to and capturing and saving and here's a perhaps more appropriate uh, for today's uh, venue um, example yeah that that's what I always used to look like before dressing up a bit. Um, you know, what does your avatar say about you? What is, wh what is, what are you projecting out there that people make inferences about? Because they will, they have nothing else to, to sort of uh, 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 go on, so they, and they have to think something about you. What is that person behind those words being typed on the screen or that action that's being taken? And so you can either try to really flesh it out and give them as much of you as you are, which would be yourself, or you can say, that's impossible. I'm just going to give you, you know, Gary, that's it. That's all you get. You can figure out, you know, I don't care what you think about what's behind the scene. Take my words. So we had this little discussion. Should we, broadcast, should we put that on the wall? So I'm thinking, well, putting that on the wall doesn't actually help. In fact, it takes away from whatever I want to say. Right, so it's a distraction from my point of view. The argument is, well, but it adds some value because people here, you guys, can see the people who are in Second Life being projected on the wall, or at least their avatars being projected on the wall. So that's the balance here. So we made this, so this kind of decision. These are the things that we didn't even have to worry about. So this gets to the notion of personal identity, Fred and Terrell have been helping me to um, um, understand certainly the, a, a lot of the technical side of this. Um, the, the things that I've been trying to read are, are things from uh, sort of the more the philosophy and 
medical side, I mean, what's your personal identity when you have Alzheimer's or dementia? Or what's your personal identity um, when you're cloned? Uh, or you have like 100 clones? So I mean, there's lots of interesting sort of philosophical issues, but then there's good basic sort of well, things I really need to worry about issues like in, in somebody stealing my identity and, and spending all my money right, kind of things. So what are the surrogates you have for yourself? Do you have a web page? Do you have tag card? Do you have a profile in MySpace or uh, Facebook or God knows where? Do you have an avatar in the Second Life? You know, those are all um, projections, really, of yourself. Some of, most of which you're at least initially familiar with and conscious of. Credit score. Hmm? Credit score. Credit score. Right. Yeah. <laughs> your your vida. Your. <laughs> Um, look on the back of your, if you have a North Carolina driver's license, all those little dots and things. There's a ton of information that's coded on there. So, right, I like to coin terms, as some of you know. And so, uh, I've coined this term proflection, which is a combination of projection and reflection. The, no, I, yeah, I know. I can defend this. So, per, your proflection of it's your surrogate for yourself. It's a projection of yourself in the cyberspace. You're probably conscious of a lot of these, like your web page or your profiles that you put up. But some of them are implicit, things like your click streams. So if you have a Gmail account and you log in and as you do your Google searches, Google knows a heck of a lot about you. It is the the combination of projection and reflection, and, if, and, and it is the projections are the things that are projected into cyberspace from yourself, either consciously or in some cases unconsciously. So if you remember Ben Blanc a few years ago, uh, we were interested in this notion of exo-information, the stuff that leaks from you as you're online. Right, that you're always kind of you know, making these actions. And you know, who's watching? Well, Scott Adams is always watching. Now, you know, if Scott really, he's our system administrator. He's not really watching, but everything's logged, at least for some period of time. And so there's always something like that going on. An email is always a postcard. Whoever wants to look at it can look at it. And so there's a lot of implicit stuff going on. And a lot of the smartest people being um, uh, sort of hired out there in, uh, in the high-tech industry are working on ads and data mining for looking at behaviors and trying to leverage those behavioral traces to sell you more stuff or to convince you to vote for whomever or you know, whatever the, mo the motivation happens to be. Change your behavior, stop smoking. You know, there's all kinds of good, good and bad reasons for doing this. Those are the projections. And we understand those. In today's world, we all basically can get a public relations person. Yeah, it can be ourselves, or we can actually hire someone if we have a lot of money, and so on. The thing that, the other half of this is a little more problematic. These are the reflections. The reflections of self in cyberspace are more problematic from my point of view. It's what others say or link about or to you. And in those things, um, you know, you might be able to sort of uh, understand that. And, you know, I want, I, you know, I want to know when somebody cites my work. Do I always know? No. Do I really care? Probably not. But, you know, it's nice to know that there's somebody out there who's sort of uh, pointing back to me. And so we've always had this in terms of our social networks. But our social networks in the past have been f relatively finite. And they've been almost manageable. Uh, you know, maybe you know 10,000 people face to face uh, over the course of your life, right? But today, we're talking millions or perhaps billions of people who might know you. Know you. You never met them, you never seen them, they never seen you face to face, but somehow they know you. And that's bad enough. <laughs> but. Here's the bigger one, and that's that it's the machines. There's a lot more machine cycles out there than there are people. And they're all out there cranking away, trying to get to know you. 
for good purposes, bad purposes, you know, and all the purposes in between. These are the things that we need to think about. Because all of these machines out there capturing our projections that we purposely or maybe not purposely let go, as well as all of these reflections by other people or other machines ref uh, uh, reflecting on us, are all themselves being reflected upon in this cascading set of surrogates for us. <clears throat> so it seems to me that if you know, we're really serious about building cyber infrastructure, and there's an actual office at the National Science Foundation now that's called that, it's not just about supercomputers. Been there, done that. We know how to do that. It's not just about bigger pipes. We're going to do those, right? That's all going to continue to happen. It's, you know, how do we live? How, do, how does this affect us, people, in this cyberspace? And part of this is how do we manage our identities? And we're going to have lots and lots of them. And thinking about those identities and reflecting on them and trying to manage them is, you know, our business. The extreme case I mentioned is ident identity theft, and you always hear about that, but I, I actually don't think that's really the problem. The problem is probably more fundamental than that. Uh, and in fact, it's going to live way beyond you. You may not care. Uh, but there may be others who care. <clears throat> so this is a fundamental issue of cy cyber infrastructure. It's a fundamental issue that people in our field and information and library science think about and study and I think have something to say about. And so my closing message to you is to you know, get on board and, and say stuff about this. Think about it and write about it, talk about it, because otherwise we're not going to have much control. You know, we're going to be at the um, uh, mercy of mainly the machines and algorithms that are out there trying to mine and uh, take advantage of our reflections. Oops. So with that, I will close. And uh, um, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, and I don't know if there's any going um, uh, coming in from Second Life. Larry can manage those. Questions? Question, Gary, you talked about earlier on a slide that it's hard to keep track of all the digital objects and also now the surrogates that are out there. Mm -hmm. I, is it really that hard? Are the techniques that we already have in place to do that? So like for scholarly publishing, I think about we have <coughs> content items. We might have reviews or things like that. And these are all sort of surrogates or other things mm -hmm. that reflect on that. Then we can capture them. We can track those objects. We can track the links between those. We can track the links in the web and stuff like that. So for video and other things, are there differences, or do we not use the same kinds of uh, technical approaches that we use for like, text time on? I think we'll use some of the same technical uh, approaches, but uh, um, uh, it, I mean, they're, they're bigger objects in, in general. And, and I, I actually don't think we, we can track that. I mean, an assignment that uh, the students in the 500 class are doing is a citation assignment in which they look at Google Scholar and they look at ISI Web of Science for the same um, um, uh, article, and they go and they find the citations. The overlaps are pathetic, and you know, and, and the coverage is ridiculous in both of those. You know, the, when we had Scopus, uh, we also did it there, and even worse. So I don't think we actually can manage this very well. I mean, yeah, we can wave our hands and say yes, theoretically we can trace all this, but fundamentally we can't. I mean, it's just there's too much of it, and, and there and there are too many dangling pointers. There are too many broken links. Uh, and there, and there, there's, uh, uh, it's going to get worse when I start you know, all the photographs I've taken of my family and my grandkids and so on. You know, most of them have numbers .jpeg as names. I mean, do I, do I re you know, I'm going to print. I've decided the ones I really care about, I'm printing. I'm taking them to get put on Kodak paper or something. And those ones I think I'll, I will actually have in 10 or 20 years. Or somebody will have them. Um, and and um, so I, I, I mean I don't think it's it's a solved problem. I think the problem of media exacerbates it and makes it even worse. Uh, you know we we don't we have really terrible tools for doing hyperlinks in video right now. Hardly any at all. But I mean those will happen, right? And so we'll be able to not only have links coming and going from sort of text objects, but from all these media objects. 
and you know, and, and I, I'm, I'm focused on video, but think about statistical databases, think about um, uh, genomic databases, think about uh, sensor streams uh, from space, or the, all of the video cameras that are uh, around the sense, uh, the sensory uh, um, uh, devices that are in the environment. Increasingly, uh, I, I'm, I'm not convinced it's all just sort of there and retrieval. Well, I guess part of my question is that I think it's technically there, but it's more. Even my own stuff, though. I mean, if you look at the personal information management uh, stuff, uh, I mean, even if I had everything on one computer instead of like four, and and, a, and, a, and you know at least one cell phone, and you know, God knows what other uh, uh, digital camera and all these other devices. I, I'm, I'm not convinced. I, I actually am going to take the time to do all that, and I'm not convinced that, that anyone's going to write the software for me, for me to do it. I mean, some, some you know, Microsoft or, or somebody will give me something that will be that, you know, personal information management system. But you know, whether that's actually going to get used uh, by me, and I'm going to take the time to do it, is a very different issue. Um, Helen, what about institutional repositories? I mean, it's just, you know, the. Yeah, you want all this stuff, and it sounds great, and I'd really like you to have all my stuff. But don't ask me to give it to you and give you the metadata for it, because I don't have the time. So when we had secretaries, we filed <laughs> And now that we don't have secretaries, this came out obviously from mm -hmm. the sales side. Yeah. We don't. And unless you're a compulsive obsessive, you won't leave the office without filing everything out of your inbox. Uh, and there are more people on the other end that don't ever move anything Uh, is there a hand over here? I thought. Paul. Paul? No, yeah. I just wanted to say to, to ask if you look at any of the the sort of group annotation video tools like in Jitu, in O J I T R. Um, just once, yeah. And yeah. That looks like for group mm -hmm. annotation, mm -hmm. just like for group tagging of yeah. uh, uh, pictures. That's pretty powerful. I mean, unless you do all kinds of nuanced right. stuff too. So there is actually technology moving in that direction. For that's useful and helpful and it does it right on top of the same kind of YouTube -ish kind of stuff. But annotations are directly on the video. Which is even more spammable. Well, I mean, yeah. yeah. So, and <clears throat> Disruptive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Video is really powerful. Uh, it's a very powerful stimulant. Um, uh, you know, you, uh, uh, Fred studying um, uh, political campaigns uh, and uh, sort of blog entries. Uh, we're we're gonna, we're trying to harvest uh, the uh, 2008 presidential campaign videos, not from the from the campaigns themselves or not from the news agencies, but from all the stuff sort of below the surface, and. You could write an article about Hillary Clinton's hair. See it messed up because, you know, she just got off the plane and it's all windblown. That's extremely powerful. I mean, you get a visual reaction to that. And when, when somebody takes a photograph of, of, a, of a candidate, when they're in mid-word and their face is all distorted and twisted, and you just freeze that and you put that still image up and you go, you want to elect this person? That's visceral. That's powerful. It's a very different, it's not a cognitive kind of act, like, like writing about um, you know, X candidate doing this sort of thing. And that affects people. And we don't really have good ways of, of managing and monitoring and counteracting that at this point. So we're in the midst of, of, a, of a kind of um, a reflective revolution, really, in terms of these media and what they're going to be doing uh, to um, either control us or empower us or free us, and, and uh, there's a lot, a lot of interesting work to be done, uh, including how do we sort of tag, mark up, make surrogates for these things, and how do you validate that your surrogate should be the one or a one that people pay attention to? Well, I'd say that. Good old-fashioned imprimaturs are going to become even more important. The UL seal of approval for your surrogate is really, really what we want. So, Terrell and Fred have been sort of working with this with sort of claim ID as a 
a vehicle for, for, for doing some of this. Uh, this, this is a, uh, a pretty important uh, problem for us. I think libraries are credible places that should have public keys. They should be holders of public uh, encryption keys. They should be taking responsibilities for uh, um, in, uh, putting their imprimaturs. Universities, uh, trusted parties, should uh, be putting their imprimaturs on things like surrogates. So the institutional repository from MIT has validity because it's MIT. Yeah, Cal? How many people do you think care about that? Because that seems like a really fundamental question. Is there the that's pretty expensive to do that, right? Right. Aren't doing that now. I mean, do people, do people just want to get this stuff off you, or do you think there's actually enough incentive right now for people to actually put resources into something like that? I think we're at a very early uh, um, point in a wave, and, and so it's an investment in the future. I think people are starting to care, and more and more people will care, and we'll, be, we'll build filters. Uh, we'll just build better filters. Uh, I mean, ultimately, you'd sort of like to see the radioactive isotope that gets attached to, at the bit level to things that says this is valid, it came from this person, and you know, I'm going to uh, uh, ensure that that's the case. That's a really hard problem. Um, so I think that the institutions that do invest in that imprimatur I think are going to reap the rewards in the long run. I mean, underwriter laboratories, I suppose, didn't always, you know, have that reputation. But over the years, um, uh, because of the uh, because of the proof being in the pudding of them actually standing behind what they validated, uh, you know, they now have a reputation. Yeah, Laura. Do you see potential development on the other side rather than explicitly claiming to say actions? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, the anonymizer. There used to be a bunch of anonymizers that you could actually you know, web browse through. And after 9-11, a lot of those things just kind of went away. I think we'll see the services like that coming back. I'm not sure that's a good, I mean, it might be a good business model. I'm not sure that's the model we necessarily want. Although, you know, in some respect, libraries would be a good place for that because, you know, we've, we've always tried to break the link between the book being checked out and the name once the book is returned and, and sort of not uh, sort of keeping those traces. I mean, if we really wanted to get on a rant here, what we'd all do is stand up and say, Google, Yahoo, um, Microsoft, you should not keep any log of any search that's done on any of your services for more than one hour. You know, it's legitimate for an hour so you can keep sessions and help people out, but just don't keep it. And let's pass laws that say they shouldn't do that. Now, that would be pretty controversial, I think. There's a lot of value in that information. I mean, I want to mine it. I'd like to study it because I want to, you know, I, I, we do user studies. We, we try to understand information seeking behavior. So I'd love to see logs over a long period of time. <clears throat> but if you really wanted to sort of restrict that, then you might sort of take that kind of political and uh, 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 in economic stance. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, and I guess I was just thinking that, like, for, say, instruction of these types of things, mm -hmm. it's like there's relatively uh, small amounts of data that are People aren't going to do extra work unless there's some real strong incentive or motive or avoidance that, that they, they uh, are, are quite aware of. <clears throat> and those things might evert, emerge, um, for better or worse, over time. So, I mean, we have to understand those things so that we can help out when those times arise. Kind of that there's a lot of stuff that sort of multiple personalities where you play at different personalities or avatars and different things that teenagers play. Um, I think it's time to stop. Let's thank Gary for a very thought-provoking seminar. To be continued. Um.